All right, we're going to get started. Welcome everyone to today's webinar on saving costs and headaches on CNC parts with John Saunders of NYC CNC. So before we get started, let me introduce myself. I'm Serena and I'm on the marketing team here at Zometry. You may receive my emails and read my blog posts. And today I will be facilitating the webinar and helping out with our live Q&A. So speaking of that, please submit your questions throughout the webinar in the question box for Greg and John to answer at any time. I'll be monitoring the questions as they come in, so please submit them whenever they come to you. After the webinar, we'll send you the recording to rewatch or share with your colleagues, and also stick around for a special discount code for our webinar attendees. So next, I want to introduce our special guest, John Saunders. John owns and operates Saunders Machine Works, a manufacturer of machine shop tools and fixture plates, and is also the star of the popular YouTube channel NYC CNC, where he teaches up and coming machinists how to use Fusion 360 for CAD design and how to run CNC machines. His latest educational CNC resource is Proven Cut, which is a video based speeds and feeds library that demonstrates the capabilities of cutting tools and CNC machines. John hopes that by sharing his expertise through his YouTube channel and Proven Cut Library, he can educate and inspire the next generation of machinists and manufacturing entrepreneurs. There he is. So John will be providing some great technical quoting and ordering tips from the perspective of a, of a machinist so you can hear it directly from your manufacturer. Next, I want to introduce Greg. Greg Paulson is the Director of Application Engineering here at Zometry. You may also know him as Zometry Greg from our well-loved and popular Will It Engineering Challenge videos. Greg brings many years of experience and leadership to our team here as well as, and is an expert speaker and panelist on all things additive as well as subtractive manufacturing. He's not only the star of our Engineering Challenge videos, but also helps to produce design tip videos, podcasts, and thought leadership blog posts. So thanks again for tuning in. Don't for, and don't forget to submit your questions to Greg and John in the question box. So I will pass it over to you guys. Great. Um, hey, Serena, thanks so much. And yeah, it's it's super exciting uh, to have John on board uh, here. We've uh, uh, we work with worked with John uh, a lot on actually our zometry supply side, uh, and we've also have a lot of fans uh, here at at Zometry on what he does and uh, and just how how you communicate, John, and how you educate. Uh, so I'm uh, just very excited um, to have you on board. And yeah, I'm not sure if there's. Uh... <laughs> no, cool. uh, thank you. It's a it's a pleasure, and it's uh it's a pretty cool world to see what's happening in, in the world of manufacturing, and yeah. uh, always learning, always pushing the envelope, but also putting on your entrepreneur hat and trying to figure out how to uh, get parts made and get parts made well is a uh, is a thing that is a uh, is is quite an art. And I think that's a, that's the way the way that you explain when you're working through it and it's trials and tribulations. And I think part of today is talking about um, these these tribal knowledge nuggets of information that have helped us along the way because we've burnt our hands on the stove before with with uh, with procuring parts, getting custom parts, um, communicating where we thought it was effective, but it turns out the machines had no idea what we were trying to say, and uh, and I think that's that's a lot of the goal of this webinar here is trying to remove those headaches proactively, um, learning from where we've been and how we understand and how we read as uh, as manufacturing experts uh, in on this. Um, so today uh, today we'll just jump right into it. Uh, yeah, I'm going to talk about this problem, like this problem of procurement, and uh, a lot of zometry solution is really in direct reflection of these uh, problems with, with procurement. So I'm going to go over uh, zometry a little bit and as well as show you uh, some of the latest and greatest on our instant pricing uh, and uh, um, live uh, live demo that. Uh, and then we're going to go into uh, the meat and potatoes here. So designing and buying custom parts. Uh, so some design tips for machining. Um, when do you source? So you you don't usually just jump in with a part and say let's go and make it like let's uh, uh, figure out like when and when and why are you sourcing uh, and how do you communicate to get the most effective uh, outcomes uh, so always think what is your outcome in mind and some some great ways to communicate that especially uh, communicating design intent 
And then uh, we're going to follow up with uh, kind of uh, more about the procurement side vendors and uh, really want to leave space for Q&A because uh, I think uh, we could talk all day on a lot of the, uh, a lot of these subjects. Um, as Serena mentioned, please use that uh, questions tab uh, throughout the webinar. If you have any uh, questions you want to ask, please feel free to fill it out, submit that. Uh, we're going to try to get to as many, if not all of them, uh, today during this webinar. So let's talk about this problem, like the problem of procurement. And this is the standard thing. I need to get something made. You know, I need to get a custom part manufactured. And uh, I am working with my ERP drop down and I see like three vendors. Or, and I'm, I'm uh, trying to figure out who does what and all I have is a name. And I go and ship out my, you know, drawing technical data. I ship out my designs to all these different things via probably like a, via probably an email. And I sit and wait. And then you get some, sometimes you get answers back. Sometimes you get another question back, like when you need to buy or what's this about? Like what's this purpose? And uh, this can often drag on for, you know, days uh, running through. And then when you get these pricing back, they can be all over the place. You could see differences in like 30, 60 percent from one vendor to, to another, and you have no idea why. The information is very opaque on why something is priced that way. Like, is it priced lower in one shop because they're trying to win your business, or because it's a sweet shop, a uh, sweet spot for that shop? Um, is it priced more this way because they're going to do a better job? And this this uh, system is very convoluted, and and for you, um, it's there's a lot of risk there. So it's just very time consuming and, and expensive. And the same thing happens for manufacturers. Um, so all these manufacturers, uh, especially small business manufacturers, just do not have the assets to really go and reach out um, to a national level to find work that is most pertinent for them. But a lot of times they are also working in that local environment. Uh, so um, their, their pricing is based off what the local needs are, you know, what type of industries they're serving. Um, and uh, sometimes, like, it's just about, like, you know, things like payment terms and other contractual things to just make it more challenging them for, t for them to take smaller work, like, you know, one-offs, two-offs, even if it may lead to something further down the line. Um, so this is a two-sided problem. It's not just for someone who's trying to source, but it's also for the manufacturers who are trying to get that work in play. Um, and that's something that we've observed at Zometry. Uh, so we decided to inject technology right at the very beginning so the, right at that that submission process uh, where you're giving that email with all that all the technical data instead we have a system where you upload your file it gets interpreted via ai to provide instant pricing and lead times so there's there's no like rfq process in the traditional sense it happens instantaneously and now it's configuration uh, so, you know, adding your tap thread holes, um, adding, selecting your materials, uh, what type of finishes you need, and configuring the part that you want. And we are actually providing this pricing that's based off a marketplace, so a market fair price for that specific scope of work. And we're also providing lead time options for whether it's expedite, a standard, or even some economy options available. But it makes this almost as easy as buying a part on Amazon. It's just a you know click and buy experience. Uh, and some of the magic behind this is we're not just one shop. You know we are actually a marketplace. Uh, and this is kind of the powerful powerful thing about Zometries. In the U.S. alone, we have over 3,000 small business qualified manufacturers uh, uh, spread across the U.S. Um, they have all sorts of qualifications needed. So if you're looking for ITAR projects, or you're looking for AS91 project, um, if you're looking for a shop that uh, uh, likes those uh, kind of job shop style uh, complex one-offs, we got those. If you're looking for a shop that wants to scale to hundreds of thousands, we got those. And we're able to uh, essentially network or create that relationship, that matchmaking between the scope of your project needs and the needs of the future of that project with those that are best qualified to make those parts. So we take that matchmaking and we do that on our end. And all you got to worry about is uploading a part. You know, you have to worry about the design effort on your side. So 
with with the zometry side of this, like I said, I'm trying to get rid of this opaqueness in in manufacturing. So we have this massive network capacity. We have instant quoting, and zometry also acts as your sword and shield when it comes to the quality assurance. So we are we are there also making sure it works being delivered on time and to spec. Um, we are actually holding, uh, you know, greater standards for our manufacturing partner network. Uh, we have something called a partner success score, uh, which is probably one of the first times these manufacturers have actually received a, almost a live update of how they're doing based off, yeah, it um, was the work done right, was the work done on time, um, communication, collaboration, all these things drive into the score. And uh, for them, the reward system is where they're able to get more work, the better they do, the more they work. Uh, and also do more work in parallel. So we we grow as these shops grow. I've I've found that in my experience uh, uh, with our relationships that we build with our machine shops, a lot of the questions uh, get less about you know what type of work can I get in, and more about growing pains. Like hey, I need to hire more staff. Hey, I'm looking at getting new equipment. What do you suggest based off your marketplace? And it's, this is really exciting growth, especially right now. I'm not sure if you guys know. I think, actually think John, I think you're in your uh, you're in your shop, so you made it in. Uh, probably the only guy in your shop, but uh, I know, uh, you know, I'm, I'm sitting in my the best corner of my basement here, and uh, there's a lot of disruption right now uh, with COVID and supply chain. Uh, Zometry's been able to help get the work channeled, uh, so not just for those manufacturers to get work so they could keep their doors open, but also for um, our, our customers, we're able to seamlessly distribute work even when supply chains are getting massively disrupt disrupted it's business as usual right now at zometry uh, throughout our network so it's a really powerful very very elastic very self self healing supply chain i'm out of breath right now so uh <laughs> but that's uh yeah it's i mean it's it's just a really really exciting uh system so i, I don't know if john if you wanted to uh chime in there or anything i'm gonna actually drive in our site re real quick here, but yeah. Well, yeah, while, while you're getting that set up, you know, I, I'll share throughout the webinar some of my experiences, which 10 years ago, I didn't really know anything about machining and manufacturing and was struggling to bring a product to market. Um, today, we're, we're a bit on the other side of that coin where we're both a provider of machine shop services, but, but also a consumer. Um, you know, 10 years ago, I didn't have uh, all the equipment that I needed to make the parts I wanted to get made. Uh, and today, not only do we still not have some of the equipment, you know, we don't have an industrial water jet, we don't have post-process services like anodizing in-house, but um, there's times where I don't either have the capacity or frankly, I don't want to deal with it. And um, I think you've got a slide coming up where we'll dive more mm -hmm. into it, but you know, there's a lot of there's a lot to be said um, when you're doing product development, R uh, and D, proving something out, you know, a process of dual tracking it where you're uh, focusing internal yep. resources on really important workflows that you need to master, let somebody else handle those first prototypes that get parts into uh, customers' hands. Uh, and that has that is very uh, complementary to a long-term insourcing process. Yeah, it, def it definitely works for us, uh, especially when you have, if you have a, if you have your manufacturing line, actually most of our, a lot of our, uh, main, our customers are manufacturers themselves in some shape or form. Sometimes it's a 3D printer, sometimes it's an entire shop. Uh, but a lot of times you have your product and, and some of that R&D steps before it's validated, it's really hard to justify to your machinist to, you know, set up your program, do all this. Um, and it's very easy for us to, you know, click, drag and upload. Um, I wanted to show you the main site really quick, and I'm going to briefly go through this. Uh, but any questions that you have on the site as well added to the Q&A. But I did want to show that under our resources tab here, um, a lot of this starts before the the parts either designed or uploaded so we have a bunch of design guides videos blog posts faqs you name it um, to learn about all these different manufacturing technologies zometry offers 11 different manufacturing technologies so that's different umbrellas all that have uh, materials and other uh, accoutrements underneath each one of them so there's a lot to learn on zometry's site um, but i'm going to go straight to the get a quote just to kind of show you how this works so we were talking about that instead of that RFQ process, it is a process of uploading a 3D file and configuring. Um, so, John, you gave me this jig yesterday, so let's take a look at the jig here. So, let's just hang out. Boom. All right. So, that's how fast the quoting system works. That, that was it, guys. Uh, so, uh, guys and gals. Uh, so, the, the pricing came out to the 
lowest cost price for this type of geometry. And in this case, it actually defaulted out to a 3D printed material. Uh, but I actually have the drawing up here and I can tell you this is a CNC machine part um, and it has some you know, specs and tolerances to it. So I'm gonna go and very quickly show you how I can go and configure this to be a actionable quote for a CNC machine part. So I'm gonna click on modify part here. And again, all I did was upload my 3D file to get started. I already attached the drawing because I had this guy up uh, beforehand. So you can see a preview of your model here. And under our processes, like I said, we have 11 different manufacturing processes. Uh, so if I wanted to, you know, I definitely can't make this a sheet metal, but if I wanted to 3D print it, I have seven different 3D printing options. Um, but let's CNC machine this. Let's make it out of 661 aluminum. You can see that my lead, my pricing updated automatically. If I go back to um, the main page, you can see my lead times have also updated. So I could get this as early as May 12th. That's uh, given two day uh, shipping. Uh, but you know, standard lead time is May 14th uh, for this uh, for this product here. So I have different options, and I can even do I can save substantial amount if I have time. And I can have an international option to get this made as well. Uh, but I'm going to go, and again, I'm just all I'm doing is driving the drawing here and just taking a quick look here. Um, I have uh, just two tapped holes. Um, I don't see anything on finishing, so let's just imagine this is just a uh, milled aluminum, two tapped holes here. And John, if you want me to configure more, I could definitely do that. But it's as easy as adding. There's my price. No more please quote quantity one, five, twenty five, fifty, one hundred. If I need, you know, seventeen, I put in seventeen. My pricing uh updates as well as my lead times will update. If this that's, project that's, uh, can I chime in? Yeah, please, please. As as a consumer of Zometry, I've found I don't know if Greg's going to get mad at me for saying this, but, um, you know, somewhere between like the $600 and $1,000 price point is where I found the machining services to hit a point where I find them to be pretty efficient. I think that probably speaks to the nature of, of machining, which we'll talk a little bit more about, which is there's some setup time and programming time and so mm -hmm. forth. But um, when I first started outsourcing parts, I really struggled with this because I thought, oh, man, I wish it was cheaper. And Number one, there's just a process of learning about what modern manufacturing is like. Uh, and the second is that um, a lot of times uh, it's not the right time to be focused on that price because, again, you're not looking necessarily at a run rate cost. You're looking at, oh, my gosh, I can upload this part. It's 200 and whatever it was, $279, and I can click order and I can get on with the rest of my day. I don't need to have an email dialogue back and forth or responding or working with folks over email. Uh, it's just done. It'll just show up at my door. Yep. And, uh, and yeah, and, and to your point, you can see that the pricing amortizes really quickly because a lot of that is that initial setup. Like there's uh, machinists are programmers. They're, 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 like, they're like software prog programmers just working in a physical means. Uh, when you think about a CNC machine, think about a robot where the arms are on the inside. And then think about how that's, how that's being programmed. That's really um, that, that upfront skill set is is what you're paying for in the cost of this and then everything else is usually incremental it's runtime um you know it's it's uh maybe some operation manual maneuvers uh if there's things like uh, inspection so i have different inspection options so i could cmm and inspect this although this probably wouldn't need cmm but if i want a formal report i could add that on so there's different uh, little things but you could see as you add this so if i want to bag and tag you can see how the price is affected and it's full transparency quoting um, so we'll get into this a little bit more, and I'm going to keep this open. So if we do want to run some games through this uh, as we're talking along, but I wanted to show you how quickly you can get quoting on Zometry's website. And if I had a whole set of parts, I could put them all on one quote and essentially quote that entire assembly, including different materials. So if I have some 3D printed parts with some urethane cast parts with some CNC parts, boom, go for it. All right. So... The other thing to, to note is that if you do need things like COCs, hardware traceability, material certs, um, we have a little certifications tab there. Uh, you can add that, even things like ITAR, you can add. All right, so let me run back here. So again, what I just showed you was that CNC quote going from a 3D to CNC, uh, but we can do, we do a lot of sheet metal work. Uh, as John mentioned, even things like flat profile cut work. So if it's a water jet or laser, um, we, we have pricing for those flat profiles within the sheet metal, metal fabrication. 
um, lots of plastic 3D printing, building thousands of parts daily, um, metal 3D printing, urethane casting, and injection molding. Uh, we've actually, uh, during COVID, we've seen a large uptick because of a medical device development, uh, especially in our injection molding and plastic 3D printing side. A lot of work has been coming through there uh, because this is a scalable you know, uh, process that we have. So we mentioned this. I'm going to stay very brief on this slide, but when I'm talking about sourcing machine parts, we're talking about things that are uh, you know, subtracted from raw stock material. So machining is, you know, drilling, milling, cutting, sawing, taking, uh, taking away material to get to my final form. Uh, that means that this material, I mean, this is this is the gold standard for manufacturing. This is we don't compare uh, this to 3D printing. We compare 3D printing to machining to subtractive technologies because it's what we know, it's what we're used to. But it also means that's huge amounts of standardization. Like I know what 6061 T6 aluminum will behave like. I could actually simulate that and get real world results in, um, once I physically make that. It's scalable. Um, we have our 3,000 manufacturers just on our network alone. Uh, you can finish it. So there's been every shape and way to actually finish uh, um, you know, different machine parts, you know, anodizing, painting, uh, heat treatments. And you get precise. I could change my cutting path, so I can, you know, a machinist can actually go change their cutting path to get, you know, to those thou tolerances, those, you know, uh, one thousandths, two thousandths uh, of an inch tolerances. And in certain, a lot of places, we can even get sub thou, uh, but for standard, usually a thou is a, a good uh, limit. Um, so with that, I'm cutting with a tool. And uh, with the, with that, when you're thinking about designing for CNC machining. First off, highly recommend checking out uh, Zometry's free design guide for CNC machining. But understand things like radii internal corners. I have a round tool. It's not going to cut a corner there. It's going to create a radius. Um, I can make sharp externals because I can actually go around the corner there. Uh, I also need to understand that these these mills and these these mills and drills are actually made of very hard but stiff uh, uh, metals and carbides and that means that the more it shakes, the more prone it can be to actually damage itself or damage the part. And so when the deeper that you go, the more robust the actual drill mill needs to be. So there's usually drill depth ratio. So in pockets, for example, it's usually like a one to four or one to six ratio uh, for the, uh, um, the drill radius to the depth of the pocket's cutting. So the deeper the pocket is, the closer to like an inch you know, uh, diameter uh, mill can go. Um, if you have something really shallow, you can be a 132nd uh, radii. Uh, and drills can go a little bit better because all you're doing is plunging them. But if if you're actually cutting on the sides, uh, it's a little bit more uh, or a little bit less forgiving. Uh, and complexity drives cost. A part like this has a lot of features that I'm just looking head on from, which means that I could actually machine those uh, just up and down with a with a three axis uh, machine. But say this had an off angle uh, feature. And all of a sudden, I've, I've added an access or added a different setup to attack that uh, feature. And that drives setups, that drives cost. If you have multiple features around, uh, that's where you have fifth access machining, where you're actually fully rotating the part while cutting. And so uh, those things add overhead to the machine. They add costs uh, to the part. And just understand, as we mentioned before, and I showed you on the quote demo, that at quantity one, you're paying for a lot of the engineering effort and those operations, and it's all being fed into that single part. Uh, but even at quantity two and plus, you're gonna see how that pricing amortizes very quickly over those parts. I think, John, to your point, that's why you're seeing that $1,000 uh, you know, sure. price point. Yeah. yeah. Will you go back one slide, Greg? Yes, sir. No, this one, this one? Yeah, I was, oh. is one on the, uh, yeah. Anyone on the webinar has, has been a machinist or, or played one at one point in their life, you'll know how, how happy you are when you see an in internal radius that's say five thousandths of an inch over a standard end mill size. So whether you, you're working in a metric world or an inch world, you know, rather than have a 0.375 inch radius, having one that's called out as say 0.39 inches, uh, what that happens to do is it allows the tool to not have to fully engage in the corner and uh, as Greg mentioned, a lot of times the beauty of machining is you can get incredibly accurate parts, uh, have really good surface finishes, are very accurate, free of chatter. Uh, and so some of those tricks about knowing uh, how to design the part, because oftentimes uh, increasing a fillet uh, or radius by, say, 15 thousandths of an inch, it's about the thickness of sheet, three sheets of standard printer paper. 
is it going to have a material effect on the uh, functionality of the part? But from, again, a manufacturing standpoint, uh, if I can use one end mill to do a lot of roughing, a lot of finishing, as well as to get into those nooks and crannies, uh, that's going to be one less tool I have to set up, one less tool I have to program, uh, and less time changing the tool out in the machine, et cetera. Yeah, I, I feel like uh, you know this better than I do. Is it like tricordial pathways, or where is it? Yeah, where you're where you're cutting to, it's it's actually software optimized to keep an even surface or even surface area contact with the end mill and the material that's removing. And it's really interesting because some some more complex patterns you can see really wacky pathways on the uh, on the parts, but it looks beautiful when it's done. Um, it honestly it's does. A- it's actually a little bit of a of a back behind the scenes connection from uh, subtractive manufacturing like machining and additive with the 3D world because what the software is doing on those adaptive or dynamic style tool paths is it's tessellating the model, so it's creating an STL behind the scenes to decide which way to move that tool bet to, to optimize the, how much the tool can do but not violate it. So from a software technology standpoint, uh, very cool technology. Yeah, it's funny, it's funny because I know I see a lot of parts coming in, including uh, we actually test our new partners, and we have uh, and we have test pieces that come in, and you can actually almost tell what type of software they've been using uh, based off the cut paths uh, that you see. Because one of the things about this, and I'm showing like general machining tolerances, understand that a surface roughness of 125, which is a standard machining surface roughness, usually it's better than that, but a standard is uh, 125RA. Um, that has to do with, if you think about a record scratcher and kind of scratching along a profile, how much is moving up and down. So the actual look of the surface can be very different. It could be sanded, it could be milled, and still pass those. Uh, so, uh, you know, it's, it is just, it's one of those things that when you're talking about general tolerances, sometimes there is a cosmetic requirement that you should note out uh, if, you, if you need it. Uh, but you see a lot of different paths and a lot of different ways to get to the same qualified product. Um, I did want to show that our general machining tolerances are that plus or minus five thousandths of an inch. So that's plus or minus about the thickness of a sheet of paper for the, you know, for the length of a part. Um, you will see that sometimes the tolerance will creep as parts get larger. This has to do with behavior of the metal itself and the capabilities of, of the machines in general. So understand that this is all on Zometry's manufacturing standards. That's part of our resources uh, on our website. Uh, but these are standard acceptable tolerances for this process, CNC machining. Um, and the good news for you is, uh, we'll go into this, but that means you don't really need a note on drawing uh, because we're already gonna hit this. We're gonna fail it if it's not if it's not hitting these general tolerances. So when we discuss tight tolerances, it's tolerances that are below this or uh, that are tighter than uh, this range. Um, so, uh, yeah, let's. Uh, so I'm going to take this first half here, and then John, I'm going to actually let you take and talk on the second part of this because you are a machinist, you're manufacturing parts yourself. But you know, when I'm sourcing, uh, it has to do with yeah, do I have the capacity? And you know, do I have the capacity to make this in the time that I need it? Uh, uh, do I have the materials? Like, am I running only one type of material, but I need something that's titanium, and I don't want my machinist doesn't want to touch that. You know, so maybe they go to zometry where we have experts in that field. Um, is it about complexity? Do, you know, uh, machine operations, fifth axis, live tooling lathes. Um, do I have a specific finishing? Do I just want to get my part? You know, I have a I have a part in front of me that is zometry made part, and obviously it wasn't cut this way. You know, it's finished this way uh, after after being precision cut, and uh, you know that's something that we can do. So when you open up your box, you can just install your uh, your hardware in this and get on with your life. Um, you know, speed, flexibility. And of course, the certifications. We are a AS9100 uh, 9, shop. Well, we also have uh, ISO 9001, uh, things like ITAR, export restrictions, um, you know, quality assurance. We have CMMs for inspecting uh, complex uh, parts. We could do that all at Zometry, and it's not all standard things that are found in every shop. So it's something that we can actually assure for you uh, working through. But yeah, I think, John, you brought this up when we were talking. Sometimes you want to make the parts first, right? Well, so, yeah, so it's, it's funny. If I have one piece of, of honest advice uh, that I've learned in the years of, of, of sourcing parts and manufacturing, it's um, if, you're, if you're even remotely thinking or willing to use a service like Zometry, go source a part. Uh, ultimately, in the long run, Zometry will probably just be one of many tools in your toolbox. But 
Uh, I think it's really important to have gone through that process, send a part out, get a part back. You'll learn a lot and you'll gain a lot of confidence because ultimately what you want to know is when you have a part that does really matter, uh, whether it's a more time critical part or if you've got a machine set up for aluminum and a top customer comes through with, like you said, a titanium job or a magnesium job or something that's peculiar and you just don't have the capacity to handle it, but you're in the business of offering that service and you don't want to say no. Uh, or, you know, for us, we've got a number of machines in house now, but sometimes we just need to get a part done and we don't want to tear down a whole fixture setup just to run that one or two uh, sample parts. That's when you want to have comfort and familiarity on how you're going to execute on that with a service like Zometry. Yeah, absolutely. And yeah, but as, as you noted before, you know, a lot of our, uh, um, I, will, I will say that customers like John actually, you know, are tend to uh, have tend to write and make their quotes in a way that uh, go directly to our machinists without any, you know, uh, without any, any issues. And I'm about to jump into this, but yeah, this is, he's, he's a machinist. Like, he know he's thinking like a machinist and uh, you know, if you're making this in house or if you're even your 3d printing for ver verification, that verification can save you like, you know, you know, costly mistakes down the line. So uh, just, just understand that it's, there's no, there's no, uh, how do I say it? There's no downside to making parts in-house too, or at least validating some in-house because it usually makes you better when you're looking to scale or um, you know commit uh, money to a uh, to an external vendor versus committing so to something that may not actually uh, pan out more than like the you know one hour opening up and reviewing and realizing your holes uh, off a little bit there. So. Yeah, uh, definitely check us out. And I actually brought this up. I know you did this in house, but this is actually a really good example of kind of mixing technologies because we have all yeah. these things under you know one roof. Yeah. I, I, I wanted to include this slide, if anything, just to push the folks that are more machinists mm -hmm. outside of their comfort zone. Um, and we are making this part. Uh, so Greg's got some pictures up. I've actually got one uh, kind of a cool backstory. Oh, cool. Nobody, nobody designed this part. It was uh, put into the Autodesk software uh, that has what's called generative design. So um, you could do a whole webinar just on how cool that is, but it's a uh, truck for a longboard, sort of a type of skateboard that'll have wheels coming off the axles here and mounts right here. And uh, basically the software was given the load constraints and then it and it backs into this whole design. It's a very organic shape, uh, five axis part that we're doing the video series on. Um, but I needed to uh, machine a fixture to hold it for op two. And I didn't want to spend the time, material, hassle, setup, risk, et cetera, making that part until I knew it was going to work. And so uh, we 3D printed it. Now, full disclosure, we have a little FDM printer here. So we did this here. Um, and this is the example I had handy. But in the past, we have absolutely used Zometry to get higher quality 3D prints that we know uh, will come back. And it's funny because my initial reaction is, oh, man, that's going to take a couple of days to get it. But, the, but as a as an entrepreneur, a lot of times it's better off to wait a couple of days if the project isn't urgent. That comes in with almost no effort or investment on your time. It gives you the chance to test it. Um, meanwhile, I've been working on other stuff, uh, and then you're ready to have a lot more confidence, and it's nice to touch and feel things. Yeah, and I, I was going to say uh, to this point, so you're you're making this, you're validating this design. If if uh, the you know if your client came back and said this is awesome. Let, we really want to show this at a show and give some away. Let's make 300 of these. You know, then all of a sudden, you know, the uh, this that whole issue of hey, do I have capacity? You have the capabilities, and you could probably you could probably take some on to get some uh, work some work going through. But it may be something where the bulk of effort could go out to Zometry, where we could distribute it to um, to you know a shop that may have multiple fifth axis machines to basically champion through on these and and crank them out. Um, so. The other thing I would would just what other thing I wanted to throw out and, and Greg can do the zometry side of uh, the customer service and the engineering support, but um, you don't need to become an expert on a lot of the processes, and certainly that's one of the awesome things about living in today's world and being able to source through platforms like this. But uh, I will encourage I would encourage folks to get as smart as you can about other processes. It'll help you make better decisions. And it's a good segue for uh, the drawing specific portion. But um, one of the things that we've done on our whole YouTube channel is just gone through, um, I will never grow tired of touring factories. And so being able to see everything from 
uh, tomorrow's video is actually on touring a NASCAR shop, which is a pretty amazing vertical integration of everything from 3D printing to machining to sheet metal and welding and fab and you know ferro arms every time you turn the corner. But you know we've got videos on EDM and on anodizing, on plating and on all these different processes because one of the keys to this is trying to see these processes from the other person's side. What's it like on their end uh, when they've got to get the part, the drawing, the CAD file, the model, the process, uh, and how do they think about it? Because that's going to help you stack the deck in your favor. Yeah, and and believe me, like we want to make your part. So you know when we're giving feedback and including like uh, on drawings and CAD design, it's about making sure that it, it's about making it more effective for both of us. So you're getting exactly, you're communicating your intent uh, in a way that our manufacturers can uh, can actually make it for you. And that includes uh, design tips and design for manufacturability. There's just certain sweet spots in every single process on what they can do and where it becomes challenging. At quantity one, uh, for example, if you have a 30 thou wall by a hole, uh, I may ignore it and I may just run it through and be really sensitive about it. But if you come back to me and say, hey, let's make 300 of these, I may raise my hand and say, let's do this change because it's gonna save 12 minutes per operation. It's gonna save you a lot of money. <laughs> Uh, in the long run, in this in this in this run, because uh, there's certain things that essentially will propagate over time, and that's why these general rules, general tolerances, uh, general design tips are so so powerful. The more you aim for that, uh, the more uh, essentially click and go your experience becomes uh, on the manufacturing side. I also want to note that one of the things that has changed, even for me in the last I would say six seven years here, um, has been this idea that drawing is king and CAD is reference. It's, it's no more. It's, it is now CAD is king and the drawing is the reference. And this is because we're working on a digital supply chain. When you upload your, your 3D model, that's being interpreted. We're giving you pricing based off that 3D model, based off the specifications that you have on that modify uh, quote modal, your inspection requirements, et cetera. When you press buy, that is digitally transmitted across our secure uh, manufacturing network to those manufacturers that can do that work best. They're interpreting that 3D model uh, they're accepting that work. They're putting that 3D model into their CAM program, which is the program that helps helps them actually program the robot, if you will, the uh, the machines, what tools are needed, how the machine will actually move, how the parts will need to be fixtured. And the first time anything physical happens is so far down the line that if you made a drawing that was different than your CAD, you know, it uh, it becomes a, you know a lot of a lot of walking back and can cause issues. The good news is we do have a DFM team that checks for that. That's one of the very first things we check for uh, post order on all our CNC jobs is it's drawing mesh CAD. But there's even very simple things like uh, making sure that your, your model is too nominal, especially if you have a unilateral tolerance um, on your part that you have, uh, that you're actually designing your part. So if, if I cut it exactly as is designed in CAD, it will hit tolerance. And I think that's just one of those um, really powerful things. Uh, I have another slide on this, but do you have any notes on the CAD, John? No, I would just emphasize yeah. that, especially if, if folks aren't aware of that sort of shift. You know, the shops that we talk to are, are their workflows are built off of getting that solid model from the customer. Uh, gone are the days where you start with the drawing, you may recreate the whole CAD, or you may program, uh, you know, handwritten G code based on a dimension drawing. Um, we're, we're certainly that this way as well as again the shops that we've talked to you want that solid model We've got workflows that are we're using to automatically apply toolpaths based on that So the quality of that solid model really matters and if you're in doubt one of the things I encourage folks to do is You know go ahead and export that solid model out of your software Whatever you're using SolidWorks inventor fusion, etc. Export that as that step file or that I just file Mm -hmm. then go ahead and re-import it to make sure it's going to look like what you're expecting it's going to look like uh, and you don't have peculiar things coming through you know one of the, the biggest uh, accidentally or intentionally modeled threads you know, usually we don't want to see that um, and so that may be something that you want to make that decision on uh, before you send the part out to, to correct that yeah, that's uh, and uh, you 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 blipped out for a second there, but uh, um, yeah, you said the biggest inventors were intentionally modeled threads, like designing in threads, right, versus using a thread wizard. Just understand that I can always make a hole bigger in machining, but I can't make it smaller. So um, a hole wizards are pretty good, even if you're mo if you're modeling that hole that's going to be tapped, model it to the minimum diameter, 
Um, and the same thing happens if I'm actually doing an external thread, you know, give us material. Uh, so uh, we want to make sure that you're, you're uh, building to that, that maximum nominal that, and then we're going to chase those threads through. Um, Just want so, to pop in here and give you guys a five minute warning so we can have a solid 15 minutes for Q&A. Uh, right. And if you have submitted your questions, please do. I see a couple have come in and we want to answer many more. Awesome. Yeah. And I think I could do five minutes. <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah, I've mentioned this before. They're drawing their, your love letter uh, to your manufacturer. So, um, I know, John, I, and I think one of the things that we can do on a follow up email to all the listeners is you gave an awesome package of good versus bad drawings, best practices uh, for, uh, for drawings here. Uh, but just, just understand that there are certain things that when we're reading, we're looking for, you know, uh, more specific. So, uh, I, for example, like if you're asking for inserts to be installed, let me know the part numbers. If you're asking for something like 832, that's very ambiguous. Like we kind of know what you want to say, but if you want to make sure that's absolutely right, you know, just just finish those three letters there. We know what it is. We know uh, how deep that those threads need to go, need to be engaged into the model now by this uh, by the sign here. We know how many we're making. Um, same thing with this, this counterbore. Again, I have enough information here that I know the diameter of the through hole. I know the diameter of the counterbore hole there. And I know how deep that counterbore is going to go. So it's very, it's very easy for us to interpret these drawings. And we do read drawings. We have, you know, these, these are, these are not computers that are doing the final interpretation by that are not doing the QA inspection. You know, we have uh, QA leaders that are going through and reading your drawings and interpreting and making sure that we're hitting uh, to your specifications. I would just add in there, uh, you had a, blur, a bullet on GD and T. Um, you know, I, as a, as a self-taught machinist, originally assumed that GD and T meant things were always going to be tighter or more difficult. And really, that couldn't be further from the truth. Uh, GD and T can help convey the areas or tolerances that actually do matter, which can result in other features uh, that don't need to be over tolerance, not needing to be over designed, which, which certainly will correlate to the price and delivery of your part. Uh, but equally importantly, a lot of times the GD and T call outs actually tell you a lot about how that part's gonna be machined and fixtured and whether it's gonna be yeah. uh, held or applied in a constrained state. So again, these are, these are ways of communicating the design intent and the end goal to hopefully stack the deck in your favor. Absolutely, and I, I was gonna say GD and T exists because other things exist. Like GD and T is because you're not making a part, you're making something that goes into a thing. And and uh, so if you know I have this part in front of me here and I have an array of uh, bosses uh, on this part. So I may call out a true true position, let me move this here, a true position call out on these because I may have a PC board, so, so a PCB that has those holes in that location. And so with GD and T, I could basically say these set of holes need to be within this range to mate with something else that exists in physical reality. And when you look at GD and T, that's what most of it is about is saying like, it's not, this is because the part needs to function. It actually needs to do something somewhere else uh, once, it's, once it's installed. And uh, once my, my mind got into that paradigm, it really helped me understand where and how to apply GD and T within drawings itself. Uh, this is also a, uh, a plug for another Zometry webinar that we did with our head of quality and manufacturing, Jason McClure, uh, called Mastering, uh, Mastering Machining Tolerances. And it's actually a really good one um, where we go over very, you can go very deep in GD&T, but we go very superficially on uh, each GD&T call, and it's, it's just very useful. So um, I see some questions coming in. This is awesome, guys. Keep on rolling in the questions. Uh, just very sure. quickly, we, we mentioned uh, this for with, uh, with Zometry. Like, we're very good as a vendor because it's one vendor, 3,000 shops, uh, and we have all these qualifications, all these standards, 11 different manufacturing technologies. So we really allow you uh, and your sourcing team to simplify your workflow when you're uh, procuring custom manufactured parts. Um, we have, I think we have 25,000 plus uh, customers. Um, we do a lot of work in aerospace and technology, medical device companies. So uh, we're highly proliferated and we're tried and true. Uh, and the beautiful thing about us is we spend so much time on our technology doing the quoting uh, side of it or we spend so much less time on that because the technology quotes, we spend more time on our customer service. So just really uh, feel free to reach out to us, support at Zometry, give us a call, do some live chat on our website. We'll make sure to help answer your questions and, uh, and work through anything that you need. And Serena, if you wanna give a promo here. 
do, do. you got instant who instant 50 yes oh, i need to update so, my gif oh uh, yes um we changed the code so that you guys can have your unique discount to use here this is valid for 30 days um just plug it in to the um, promotional code um input fields there and then you can get 50 dollars off your order of a hundred dollars or more so go ahead and use all the knowledge you use here to quote your parts. Yeah. And if you don't have anything to order right now, you can always refer a colleague or a friend. So when you give $50, you can get $50 when your referral orders for the first time. Yeah, and these are these are credits that can be used for the dollar value against parts. So it's it's kind of like paying paying for your prototyping uh, with uh, with referrals there. So yeah, Q and A. Let's uh, thank you guys so much. So let's uh, let's uh, answer some questions. Yes. All right. So the first question we have here is: Is there any cost slash end mill machining accuracy differences when milling the edges of the channel using a ball, end mill, or straight? So uh, and feel free to chime in in the chat or uh, the question form if I'm misunderstanding this, but. Um, it's a if you're machining a slot, let's say you have a quarter inch slot going through a feature, um, subject to, to the tolerances, um, you would really not use a quarter inch end mill because when you do so, you're not going to get what's considered an on size or on size or an accurate slot. So we would normally use something like a three sixteenths end mill um, to do that and, and then take a few passes to open it up to the slot dimension. The um, question though relating to the ball end mill or the straight end mill uh, is a great one. Many of the tools that we like to use will have a slight corner radius, say only maybe five thousandths of an inch. So that technically makes them what's called a bullnose end mill, um, but not really because it's really just rounding off that very weakest point of the uh, cutting tool itself, which is most likely to break. Um, it also can have the byproduct benefit or side effect of reducing a sharp point in the machined part, which could be the a uh, point for a stress riser or a crack to propagate through. Um, but in terms of the cost or accuracy differences, no, there wouldn't be any. Yeah, because you're, you're engaging so little of those uh, of the mill as it is. You're either engaging that radius or you're engaging like the, the small ball end. It's, it's, it's similar. And I think that also just leads to what's going to happen is it's going to take time and it's going to add overhead to the machine. So uh, I know we do a lot of, or we've actually justified uh, a lot of casting projects into just milling uh, due to the quantity needs because uh, casting often has like a you know six to eight week lead time and we're like well we could just mill it uh, but one of the biggest design for manufacturability changes that we do is we ask uh, uh, we ask the designer to remove drafts and the reason why is it's a lot easier for me to remove material vertically uh, when I'm using a using an end mill uh, but as we're talking, we're in this case you're using is you're talking about having a straight and just essentially putting a radius or chamfer on the side of all radius. Uh, but if you think about draft angles the same way as just this constant, very minute engagement of a tool moving through, you can add hours to a part. Um, I know zometry we have these little X tile uh, features that are very small. I have a 3D printed silicone one here, uh, but on a three-axis machine, if this is laying down. I kid you not, it's one hour to make this contour on a on a part, and so I it is one hour to make this this uh, shape on a tool tool engaging. So I could you could get creative over quantity, but that's that's how much time you're adding just by adding some very simple angular or like drafted features in a milled, milled part. One last thing I would add, if, if you're not certain, but you are say focused on either the cost per part or the time frame. Uh, take liberty in, in the drawing and communicating mm -hmm. that intent. Um, I would, the one thing I do like to see is keep that information focused in the drawing. It can be very challenging if folks get, uh, if messages or important things are delivered over email, then over a phone call, and then off in the drawing, you really want to use that drawing uh, as a as a point of reference. But one of the one of the best light bulb moments I've ever had was when I saw somebody else's drawing sent in somewhere and not not a particularly simple part and then but there was an area in the part where the drawing had a call out that i had never seen before and it said feel i'm paraphrasing feel free to use this area and add holes or features as necessary to aid in fixturing 
And it just kind of was like, blew my mind that you're having this two way, you know, subject to approval or must be approved, et cetera. But really creating that dialogue to say, hey, let, let me help you make this part. It's okay to do that here. Uh, really good little nugget. I just, that just, I think we made this uh, 16 inch polypropylene box essentially uh, for aerospace. And I wish they had that there because the thing <laughs> was slipper, slippery as heck uh, trying to fixture down. Um, I saw, I see, hey, I'm going to jump ahead because I saw one asking about inspection uh, on inspection services there. Uh, yeah. So I see, uh, Greg, can you elaborate on inspection services? Uh, it's a tight, uh, a tight tolerance inspection performed directly by Zometry, um, or do you uh, uh, do you contract with inspection houses? So it's twofold. Uh, Zometry does have a full quality assurance uh, facility. Uh, so every new partner essentially gets a double QA, which means that the work that's being uh, produced uh, should be right by that partner, but then it goes to our facility before it goes to our customers to make sure that it is, that it is right. Uh, we we take quality very seriously at Zometry. Um, from an inspection side, so that's, for example, just our our, uh, our QA side has every manual tool you could possibly imagine, from calipers, micrometers, gauges, et cetera, um, but we also have a, um, a digital comparator. We have uh, a, a virtual CMM. Uh, we have a full uh, eight-foot table CMM because uh, we do a lot of large parts at Zometry. And if our manufacturers don't have the capabilities to do that secondary uh, inspection, um, those parts can come back to our facility for that secondary QA of it. Uh, but we also have a lot of uh, professional shops that have their own equipment in-house. So say there is something where they need to do a CMM with a dimensional report, um, they can run that on CMM and they file that uh, that dimensional report with uh, uh, within Zometry's uh, secure uh, system. So we always have records of it uh, to trace back to, as well as you'll get a copy of that report uh, um, with that. So when you're quoting, so for example, this is a CNC machining um, and, and sheet metal options that we have. Uh, standard inspection, you're not gonna receive a report, uh, but formal inspection you'll receive uh, essentially kind of like, looks like the hand reports that when you look at all this, uh, uh, look at all the measurements, we say, you know, in out, we, we put in our, our recordings there. Um, CMM is usually for, you know, much more complex and you're gonna get that bubble drawing and report there. Uh, FAI is just, it's that, but with a little bit more um, complexity around how it's documented uh, for per AS9102. Source, if you need source inspection, you know who you are, but if you don't, don't worry about source inspection, because uh, that is, uh, that's there because we deal with some major aerospace customers that uh, require it, um, but just understand that, that is a, um, that's, uh, that is probably overkill for most there. And then if you have like a 100% critical inspection on a few requirements, click custom, uh, write in what you need and we'll take a look. Awesome, thanks Greg. So what about customers who want to learn good drawing practices? How do they go about that? John, send your, send your just, sheet over right so, now. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So if you go to uh, our uh, sort of education site, uh, nyccnc.com, we have a library uh, with a number of, of free articles for folks. And the one that we just added uh, actually for this webinar was called Basic Drawing and GD and T Rules. And I would only encourage, I would only say that this is very much done so in the spirit of practicality. This is not the college full-blown, dry, lengthy overview um, of drawings. And then what we did was we took that part that Greg had uploaded to the Zometry engine. Um, and we had a good drawing already for it, but we went ahead and uh, we went ahead and made a bad drawing because I'm a visual learner. And so sometimes only seeing a good drawing doesn't help. You need, you need to see that bad drawing as well. Uh, and we've got a cheat sheet there showing all of the offending things of what, what makes a bad drawing a bad drawing. Uh, and that should really cover a lot of the basics for a uh, sort of prismatic part in the drawing and the features uh, and the layout views that you need to show. To and I was going to say on uh, so I was going to say on the on the drawing side uh, too. Um, it is very common uh, to see sometimes when you're copying over title blocks from another uh, from another Mech E. Just make sure that those notes still make sense for what you're asking for, um, especially if you are prototyping. Uh, so, like I said, these are love letters to your manufacturers. Um, if you are asking for just mill it, tap some tap some holes, but you're applying a drawing that also has 
a different material. For example, a lot of people times you're substituting aluminum as the cheapest material where the part may eventually be made out of a much more expensive, like, you know, like a titanium, for example. Um, and just making sure that the, um, that you're either redlining that drawing or you're putting the note somewhere to ignore like notes four, five, seven, eight uh, on this is really, really powerful um, uh, for, you know, especially for on the prototype, you know, low volume stage. Uh, because it's going to cause someone to raise their hand. We're going to ask a question, which is okay. We want to. We want to catch it before we're, you know, we're, before we're cutting metal. Uh, but uh, um, it's it's just much more clear if you have notes saying, hey, uh, you don't need to, you know, oil dip this in a in a, a post thermal cure. Uh, so we we like that. <laughs> All right. So more specifically on GD and T. So this person often struggles to find job shops that are well enough versed in Y14.5. Are Zomtree shops vetted for this? So I'm almost positive the answer is yes, but I actually need to look into that. Uh, but I got your information. I'll, um, I'll give you a follow up right after this on that. Um, we do have, uh, so uh, on our site, so on, on Zometry's main site, uh, you'll actually be able to uh, um, to go to our FAQs and look at our standard inspection and sampling plan. So um, if you are, if you're looking at something like inspection, you'll be able to read more information about our inspection and sampling plan here, which is, this is a little bit of a novel, but it's, there's a reason why, uh, because these, these questions get asked and uh, you'll be able to learn a lot more about um, our information, what standards we hold as a regular and then uh, I'll also go look at your uh, standard and I'll follow up with you directly. Yes, and on that note, um, if we don't get to your questions, we will, mm -hmm. Greg and John will be following up with you after the webinar, so don't worry. Um, and then we'll also be sending out the recording again for your reference. Mm -hmm. uh, but we have a couple of minutes left and a couple of yeah. questions. So the next question is, is there any way I can negotiate the quote generated by Zometry's AI quoting system? Yes. Absolutely. Uh, so um, our AI quoting is a it's a very powerful tool, and uh, you know it's it's uh, it's very good. Uh, that being said, you also are will get assigned a dedicated account representative uh, if you do have a competitive quote or a historic quote that you've been working off before, um, or you just want to ask some questions about pricing. We have full time staff. Uh, so we have staff. We have application engineering experts uh, in their respective fields. So whether it's a sheet metal injection mold, et cetera. Um, we have the experts on hand to give a manual review of that, and we can update that, that on the site. So um, absolutely, uh, bring it on. We're happy to see, see more. Okay, and last question, I believe, is when dimensioning a part, do you prefer to think about fixed versus a moving jaw on the, I think it's IVSE, vice. sorry. On the vice. On the vice. I think what I think what they're getting at there is this question of of kind of the the part that you're trying to machine relative to the, to the net additional material, say the piece of stock that you're working with. And there are some tips there. You know, a lot of cold rolled steels uh, steels come very much on size, so you're not going to be able to machine a critical nominal dimension like two inches out of a two inch piece of bar stock because there just isn't enough material to machine. Uh, regardless, when we are thinking about setups, parts, accuracy, et cetera, uh, we always use datums off of the fixed side of the jaw for sure. Yep, I think I think you uh, you hit it on the head. And like I said, uh, when I would just go back to also those general tolerances. Uh, so it's what I call like the title block tolerances. So you know the two decimal points, three decimal points uh, tolerances. Just making sure that you are using uh, the standardized tolerances per the process that you're uh, you're using. For example, machining tolerances do not fit 3D printing tolerances, or they don't really fit sheet metal tolerances either. Uh, so just be aware of the process that you're ultimately intending this product to be worked in, and make sure that you're you're having your drawing reflect uh, those general tolerances. And then from from the point of dimensioning, you should be just calling out things like you know tapped holes, threads, GDT callouts, uh, and anything critical that if I were doing a bubble drawing, like a, an inspection report, that you want feedback on, whether it's pass uh, pass or fail. Great. Well, thank you so much for answering those questions. Um, again, if you have any more questions, feel free to email Greg, reach out to John, um, and we can follow up.
on any of your projects or questions also connect you with your dedicated account representative. Any other comments from you guys before we close out here? Thanks for having me on, I appreciate it. John, thank you for being here. Yeah, it, it's exciting. Like guys, I've had more fun prepping for this too. I'm like, ooh, I get to talk to John Saunders more. So uh, um, I really do want to recommend uh, not only checking out, you know, obviously like Zometry's work, we do some we do some really fun stuff, but uh, check out NYC CNC. I honestly, um, uh, it is like being in the shop. You know, I've, uh, it, is, it is like understanding kind of where the, not just, how parts are made, but why they're made, or what what approaches are are used to make something uh, in in reality, and it's just it's very inter interesting, and you get you do it in an awesome way, John. So yeah, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thanks so much, guys. All right, thank you. All right, cheers. Bye -bye.